Okay, so we need to talk about the two types of forces. And you may think, hey, wait, there's only one kind of force. Well, well there's a whole bunch of kind of forces, but we can break them into two groups. So let's start with a quick review. So first, the nature of force. What does force do? Uh, a force, I like the definition to say the force changes the momentum of an object. So we can have this as the momentum principle. This says the net force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. And yeah, you could write that as derivative, but I got that, okay. And momentum is the symbol P, and we represent that as mass times velocity. Now, you can, you can change this into what people call Newton's second law, which I'm not too fond of, just for a lot of reasons, but uh, F net equals MA, it's, it's essentially the same thing. It's not completely, but it's essentially the same thing. Now, the other big thing about forces is that forces come in pairs. So if I have this ball colliding with a wall, ball A is colliding with the wall, then the wall B pushes on A, so it's FB on A, okay? But it's an interaction between both things. So the ball pushes back on the wall with the exact same magnitude force, just in the opposite direction, okay? So that's, that's everything we need to know about forces. Very useful, uh, but now let's break them into two groups. So the first group is called, I call it, calculated forces. So these are all the things that we, in introductory physics, uh, especially the first semester. These are the things that we can calculate right away. So let's go through some of these. Uh, the first is Earth gravity. So on the surface of the Earth, we use this model for the gravitational force. We say that the gravitational force is equal to the mass of an object times little g. g is a vector, and it's called the gravitational field, and it has this value. So it's in the negative y direction, but it's still a vector. Okay. So just be careful. I, I'm trying to be careful about vectors. Um, you know, some people would put negative mg. That's that's the y component of the gravitational force. But now I'm just talking about something else. Okay, so that's that's one thing. We can calculate the gravitational force. Here's a better gravitational force. Uh, how do we deal with these objects circulating the, the Earth that are far away? They're not close to the surface of the Earth. Well, if I have two objects, object one and object two, uh, and they're separated by a vector r, then I can calculate the gravitational force. It depends on g, which is a constant, 6.67 times to the negative 11th, mass 1, mass 2, the distance between them squared, and then that r hat, that's just a unit vector from 1 to 2. And this gives me the gravitational force actually on object 2. Okay, that's why the negative sign is there. Um, but, but I can calculate that. And then if I wanted to, I could calculate the other gravitational force. They're the same, but pulling in opposite directions. But that's it. Okay, very, very useful uh, if you want to model space stuff. Everyone likes space stuff. Here is the Coulomb force. It's hard to, it's hard to find good examples of this. These are those, uh, if you take some clear tape and you pull them apart, after sticking them together, they're, they're electrostatically charged. You hold them near each other, they repel. It's kind of cool. Actually, you got to do it twice. So this is the Coulomb force. If I had two points that had electric charge, uh, point one and point two, this looks a lot like the uh, gravitational force, except instead of g, I have another constant, one over four pi epsilon naught. Uh, instead of m1 and m2, I have q1 charge on one and q2 charge on two, and there's no negative sign. There's no negative sign because if the charges are the same value, then it repels and, um, but you can't have one negative and one positive and it attracts, whereas mass are always attracting. But it looks the same, same, same formula. You can calculate that. Okay, here is another uh, useful one. Again, this one's kind of a trick, but we can still, still use it. Suppose I have a spring and it's up there and it has some unstretched length L0. Now I stretch it, I pull it so that it has a length L. And I'm gonna represent the length of this vector L. Okay, which is going to be useful. Uh, then it's going to stretch some distance s, and it's going to have a spring force pushing back on that left mass to the that yeah, red mass to the left, and that's the spring force. I can calculate that spring force since this force of that spring is proportional to the stretch. So this is the best way to write that out as an expression. If you want to write it as a vector, then we have k. That's the stiffness of the spring, it's the spring constant. The magnitude, then we have to take the difference between the magnitude of L and then unstretched length, and then multiply that by the 
unit vector in the direction of L. This equation allows us to do like three-dimensional spring stuff, so it's actually very useful. But the key thing, again, is that we can calculate the, the force due to a spring. Now, a lot of textbooks have this equation. The spring force is negative Ks, where S is the stretch of the spring. Don't write that, okay? Because it, you can write F spring equals Ks, but don't put the negative here. Because the negative doesn't mean anything unless you're dealing with a vector, okay? If you, if you say the stretch is in the S direction and the spring force is in the opposite direction, that makes sense. But if just writing it like this is probably a bad idea. But I'm just being difficult here. That's what happens at some point you get difficult. Okay, moving on to the next calculated force. Here is air resistance. So when you drop something, there is a uh, force that the air pushes on it that's proportional to the velocity squared in this model. Okay, these are all just models, really. Uh, in the expression, uh, rho is the density of the air. A is the cross-sectional area of the object. C is the uh, drag coefficient that depends on the shape. V is the velocity. V hat is the unit vector for the velocity because once I take the magnitude and square it, I don't have a vector anymore. Again, very useful, very useful. Uh, this is the Lorentz force. I kind of already talked about this because we talked about the electric force. But if you have, and I, I use the example of a, this is a Hall effect probe. Uh, so if you have a charge moving in both an electric and a magnetic field, then there's an electric force and there's a magnetic force. Uh, the magnetic force depends on the velocity and the magnetic field, uh, but it's still something that I can calculate even if it deals with cross products. And now you may say, well, wait, uh, you have all these forces. Aren't there just four fundamental interactions? Uh, yes. And this picture is from Brookhaven National Laboratory. I, I just don't want to leave this blank. So I put a cool picture because this is from, uh, you know, high energy physics experiments, you try to determine the fundamental interactions. Okay, so we have the gravitational force between objects with mass. We have the electromagnetic force uh, interaction between objects with electric charge, the strong nuclear force, which we're not going to deal with here, but it does deal with, uh, you know, nucleus type stuff, protons, and then the weak nuclear interaction, because yeah, that one's so difficult to explain, it's not really even a, yeah, don't worry about that. Okay, but yeah, those are the same thing. You know, everything in the previous examples was either the gravitational force for the gravitational force or the better gravitational force or the electromagnetic force, okay? A spring force is actually an electromagnetic force because the atoms in the spring are, have an electromagnetic interaction with the other atoms such that you get this, we can model it as Hooke's Law, okay? And the air resistance is technically electromagnetic because uh, we have particles interact with each other when they get close. Okay, what's great about calculated forces? I can take uh, a, a, a situation like this. This is a double spring pendulum. So it's two masses connected by springs that can move in two dimensions. So I can, my, I can make this model by calculating the forces on each mass, which in this case depends on the positions of the masses. And I can use that to update the momentum of the two particles, and then I can use the momentum to update the position, and then I can use, I can also update time, and that can just repeat this forever. And this is what I get for this very, very complicated situation that's actually not too difficult to model if I can calculate the forces, but I have to be able to get an expression for the forces. And those, those are not strings, okay, those are actual springs. And you can see it's kind of jiggling around. Okay, so that's calculated forces, and that's what's so great about them. Now we have constraint forces. I would usually say forces of constraint, but I just want to make it match with calculated forces. Here is an example of a cylinder rolling down an incline. And if you want to look at the forces on this, it's not too easy. We have the gravitational force, but we have these other forces. We have the force between the uh, the cylinder and the disc, and then there's a frictional force. So that's a, it's a tough problem. Okay. Here's another tough problem. This is just a block sitting on a plane. Okay. But again, it's going to have that normal force. It's going to have friction force. So let's talk about those kinds of forces with the simplest example. 
here we have the I, I said block and that's not technically a block but come on it's just a weight it's a 500 gram weight it's sitting there on a table and it's not moving so I can create a diagram for that so there's my the blue thing is the block the mass and then the table and what forces are acting on this block well I have the downward pulling gravitational force mg uh, I also have the table pushes up I call that the normal force now since the acceleration of this block in the y direction is zero then the normal force pushing up has to be equal to the gravitational weight pulling down in the y direction and so in this case the normal force would be equal to in magnitude to the gravitational force now what if I take that same mass and I push down on it with my finger now there's a slightly different situation because I have an extra force on the block. So I still have the gravitational force. The mass of the block did not change. So the gravitational force did not change unless you change the mass of the Earth or something like that. And then I also have this downward pushing force from my finger. I'm calling that FP. And then I have the upward pushing force from the normal force. And it has to be bigger, right? It has to be bigger. Because now the only way that these forces can all add up to zero is to, for that normal force to increase. And so my y expression here would be n minus mg minus fp equals zero. And you see that if I, if I push down with a force equal to the weight of the block, just for simpl uh, simplicity, then the normal force would have to be twice as much as it was before. Now, what if, what if I had... Uh, a twice a normal force as before in the previous case without the force pushing down then the forces wouldn't add up to zero and it would accelerate up it doesn't do that okay so this has to be exactly the right force in order to prevent this block from going up or going through the table this normal force is constraining the motion of that block that's why it's a force of constraint but you see, the normal force can't be some just one value, and they can't just have one simple equation for normal force. If you look up what's the equation for normal force, you're not going to find it in the textbook. Okay, here is another uh, force of constraint that we're going to see that we run into a lot, tension. So here you see a rope, uh, and the ropes can exert forces. Uh, they can only pull in the direction of the rope. Okay, and we like to deal with these special massless ropes because if the rope has mass then different parts of the rope pull differently and it gets more complicated but in introductory physics we almost always deal with ropes that have no mass and they can only pull in one direction so but it, other than that it's just like the normal force it pulls in order to prevent the rope from getting longer that's what they do okay and and you can take a rope in a situation like this Actually, I, found, I was looking for a video of a swing. This is my, my, this is actually my brother and my grandmother, probably from 1973. I'm gonna guess, okay. Uh, but he's swinging, and and a swing or a pendulum is quite difficult. Here is a mass moving in a part in a circle, supported by a rope. So we have the downward gravitational force, and then we have the tension pulling in the direction of the rope. But you see, what's the equation for the tension? I mean, there, there's no equation for this tension. Okay, it That tension provides whatever force it needs to keep that mass not going past that circular arc. Okay, It, it doesn't want to extend, even though it technically it does extend. It doesn't want to, and that's the way we model it. Okay, But you can't write down this as an equation. Yes, you can, you can determine the constraint, it has to follow this path and then I can use a bunch of tricks to get the equation but there's no equation for tension it's a force of constraint okay here is uh, another situation it's another block but now suppose I push this block to the to the right just like this and it doesn't move it stays there so I have the downward gravitational force and then I have the upward normal force and these two have to have the same magnitude because the block doesn't accelerate up or down then I know that I'm pushing it to the right, so there has to be a frictional force, I mean a, a push force to the right. But since it doesn't accelerate, there has to be a backwards pushing 
frictional force and using this I wrote this as a vector equation since uh, and these are all plus right okay cuz mg is in the downward y direction but you still add them up together all these forces have to add up to the zero vector and so you could find the frictional force and you could find the normal force um, and yes there is a zero vector okay that means yeah don't worry about that okay now what if I pushed with a greater force and it still didn't move the only way for that to happen would be for the frictional force to also increase as long as it's not sliding those forces have to add up to zero in the x direction so here we have uh, the static friction model and it is just a model this frictional force depends on the two types of materials interacting so the, the tabletop and the wood or uh, Teflon and steel or glass and glass whatever it depends on the force pushing those two materials together in this case the normal force uh, the force of friction is parallel to the surface and it pushes in a direction to prevent relative motion between those two uh, you can break this okay it's just a model but here's the model so the magnitude is not a vector equation okay because I that's what the parallel to the surface the magnitude of this frictional force is less than or equal to the normal force in times some coefficient of static friction that depends on the two types of surfaces and uh, that coefficient of static friction is almost always less than one okay but that's why that less than or equal to is there now you may say well it's a calculated equation though it's calculated if you know the normal force which is a force of constraint and even then that tells you it has that's the maximum friction force so static friction is a hundred percent a constraint force okay we have also uh, kinetic friction uh, it's still a model if an object is sliding I thought I had a picture here but that's fine uh, it doesn't depend on the velocity uh, it does depend on the types of materials it how it has a constant magnitude force and it's generally lower than the static friction between the two surfaces and here's here's how to calculate so this does have equal to um, and it's a different coefficient it's still a force of constraint because you don't know the normal force okay so you can cheat here's my uh, example of cheating here is a this is actually on the right you see two objects one is a pendulum using differential equations to solve the motion and the other one is a mass on a spring with a really really high stiffness and you can see they move the same okay so I can cheat with a string by pretending like it's a spring because spring is a calculated force so I can actually model that by just calculating the forces each time and that's really nice so where are we so just to just to be clear where we are we have two kinds of forces calculated and constraint uh, the calculated if you're writing a numerical calculation if you're modeling the motion of something in Python and you have friction or a normal force good luck okay you're gonna have to cheat or figure out some way to do that um, it's pretty tough technically there is no force of constraint okay the, everything is really one of those fundamental interactions the if you have two things with friction uh, it's really all the atoms in one material interacting with all the atoms in the other material uh, so it but we, we don't want to deal with all those atoms we we make this constraint force or friction there is no equation for tension or normal force okay you may get an expression for it in a particular problem but there's no what's the tension equation what's the normal force equation okay so that's where we're at and it's important to realize how to deal with these kinds of forces uh, maybe later on in another course we can deal with force of constraint with other ways other than the momentum principle but but this is where we're at now and I just want to make sure that you are cool with that all right I'll talk to you later and we'll do some more physics some other time